Uh, last time, we talked about this electron phonon coupling, which uh, renormalizes both the phonon frequency and also electron uh, band structure. So we finished the uh, discussing about the phonon frequency corrections, uh, which leads to the cone anomaly. And then we return to the electron energy corrections, okay, which is due to the electron phonon coupling. And in particular, we focus on zero temperature ground state properties where the Bose factor and Q vanishes. And in that case, the total energy at the second order in perturbation, where we treat this electron phonon coupling as a weak perturbation, is given by this term here, where there's no contributions to Bose factor because this already vanishes at zero temperature. And we focus on this term, which will modify this electron band because we know that this free electron band is simply just this quadratic band, right? So you know very well. But then after including the electron phonon coupling, this band got modified. And the modification of this electron band is given by the second term right here. And we could uh, organize the second term in such a way that it uh, consists of two terms, and each term uh, could be understood in a separate way. Okay, so the first term involves this energy denominator, epsilon k minus epsilon k prime, and minus h bar omega q, whereas omega q is the phonon frequency. And this term doesn't depend on this Fermi function. Okay? And the second term depends on the Fermi function, because this nk prime appears in the numerator, and in the denominator, you get you know, energy difference square of electron subject by this square of the phonon energy. So whether this term depends on this Fermi function or not leads to a different interpretation. Okay, so the first term always exists. Okay, it doesn't matter whether your material is a metal or insulator because there's always such a term right here. But the second term exists only in metals because you got a Fermi function, and the Fermi function tells you that this system is metallic, right? Uh, for insulator, you won't have such a Fermi function in any of the calculations. Consider this finite temperature of your Fermi function. So at finite temperature, the Fermi function uh, is actually a smooth uh, crossover from one to zero. So that's for a partial field electron band, and which is exactly what we call metals. But if you don't have such a Fermi function involved here, and oftentimes this is an insulator where you have a, a charge gap between the valence and conduction band. And the valence band is it already completely filled, and so there's no way that the Fermi function could play a role here for insulator. Uh, but for metal, you can have both contributions. And that actually tells us about the universal property of this phonon modified electron band. So, you know, electron phonon coupling modifies everything, including, you know, the electron band in the insulator as well as in metals. Okay, so in metals, there are two contributions. And insulators, only the first term survives. But in either case, you get some correction to the electron band for both insulators and metals. And this phenomena should be observed in any case for all materials. And this kind of uh, electron phonon coupling, which dress, dress up the electron, you know, when the electron moves, and this combined system is called polarons. And the polarons, due to electron phonon coupling, will lead to the electron mass enhancement, which we will discuss in just a moment. So let's just talk about the cartoon picture of the polaron. What is the polaron? So when you uh, study the introduction to solid state physics, I believe that you should have noticed this terms, but you probably didn't understand what it means. Okay, so the polaron is actually some kind of a quasi-particle, okay? So it is the combination of the charged particle 
and the nearby electrical polarization field, such as the electric fields associated with that charged particles. And in this particular case of electron phonon coupled materials, this is the cartoon picture which you can easily understand, allows you to understand this concept of polaron because the electron uh, actually uh, goes in the direction of the arrow, but then there's many ions nearby. An ion carry positive charge, an ion can move, can vibrate, right? And the ion could give rise to the, you know, the, uh, the phonons, and the electron coupled to phonons. So effectively, electron coupled to all those nearby ions because of the lattice vibration and by electron phonon coupling, and so electron are no longer free independent charged particles anymore are not free, freely moving charged particles anymore. Because the electron coupled to phonons and to lattice vibration to ions. And so you should combine all these nearby ions together with electrons inside. And you should look at this as a, as a whole. And you cannot consider the electrons as independent moving particles. And this whole system is a collection of charged particles. Inside this collection, you have electron in the middle, but then you have positive charged ions surrounding this electron. Right? But of course, you have another electrons somewhere here, and there, and there, and so on and so forth. But then all those electrons individually are actually surrounded by the nearby ions for each electron. So all electrons should be considered in this polaron pictures. Uh, but then where is the electrical polarization field? Of course, this electron carry negative charge, right? And ion positive charge. So of course, there is an electrical polarization field pointing between electron and ion. And because they are coupled together, so there should be some polarization field, which is electric field say, pointing along the direction of uh, ion and electron positions. So there are many such uh, polarization fields or electric fields in this cloud. Therefore, uh, you can consider the whole thing as a collection of charged particles and the nearby polarization fields. And that's the meaning of this word, polaron. The polaron is the quantized particle or quasi-particle, which is precisely this collection here. Because this, this polar refers to this polarization field. And this you know, last two letter round refers to the particle. Because electron, right? Phonon. Okay, so they all end with this O end. So this O end refers to some particle. And this particle Factory is made of charged particle and electrical polarization fields. Okay, so if you look at this charge profile uh, in real space uh, of your material, and you will find that in the say the uh, origin zero zero refers to the electron position. So you do not consider electron as just a negative charge particle, but you should also include all these positive charged ions and uh, as, a, as a cloud here. Okay? So the total charged particles inside the cloud is, of course, positive. Because there's just a single electron, but there are many positive charged ions. Okay? So if you look at this um, you know, uh, electrical charge distributions nearby the any of this uh, electron, you'll see such a uh, oscillations or kind of a fluctuations in real space that this charge actually fluctuate between plus and minus and plus, minus, and so on and so forth. So of course, just outside this cloud, there's some electron okay, because the positive charge ions actually moving inside the cloud, leaving behind the charged particles just outside the cloud, a negative sign. Okay, and then you have such uh, oscillations um, for all the electrons. And this kind of uh, collection of positive and negative charge 
particles with electric polarization is actually kind of a quasi particle that we just realized in the electron phonon couple system. Okay, remember in the Hartree Fock or electron electron coulomb interaction, we also uh, have this electron dispersion, which is modified by the electron electron coulomb interaction. Okay? And of course, this is also an example of a quasi particles, but then the quasi particle in this coulomb interacting electron gas refers to the fact that coulomb interaction modifies electron energy. But here, we found another quasi particles where the electron band is modified by electron phonon coupling. And such a quasi particle we call this polaron. So when, when you read all this introductory or advanced solid state textbooks, and you should understand by now what this means. And if you wish you could consider uh, another, say, uh, very popular cartoon picture where a Santa Claus carrying a bag, and inside the bag there are many gifts for children, all right? And that Santa Claus is the electron in the middle, and, but that Santa Claus is carrying something very heavy, gifts, okay, a bag. And that bag is precisely all the surrounding ion that the Santa Claus is carrying. So, so then the Santa Claus is really heavy. He is already um, you know, overweight, and then he carry another heavy bag so that Santa Claus is really walking very, very slowly. And the mass of the Santa Claus becomes even larger, and which we call this mass enhancement. So when you, you know, uh, look at this terms, mass enhancement, you know, this picture that in your mind should be Santa Claus. Right? So this is a very, I think, good analogy that you can understand you know, right away. Okay? So electron carry a bag of this um, you know, ion cloud and becomes heavier. Okay? So if you look at this effective electron mass, you will find that this mass increases quite substantially because of this electron phonon coupling. So we will address this electron mass enhancement because of the electron phonon coupling in just a moment. But the physics is very clear. Because of this coupling between electron and phonon or ions, effectively electron carry a cloud when they move. Okay? So they are not moving independently, but they carry a bag, a background ion charge with them. And therefore, um, the velocity of electron is actually slower or smaller, and the electron mass becomes larger. And this cartoon picture helps you to understand all this physics. So this is just a, one example of uh, electron mass enhancement. But you can imagine there are many such uh, interactions in solids which couple to electrons and which makes the electron heavier, such as in heavy electron system in transition metal compounds that in the periodic table, you know, you get some um, transition metal and uh, many compounds that are formed uh, in that area of the periodic table are called heavy fermion metals or superconductors, where, you know, the word heavy fermion refers to precisely the enhancement of the electron mass because of some interactions that are coupled to electrons. And this is just one example that electron couple to phonon, but electron can couple to other things, such as spin. Okay, electron spin coupled to um, some local moment spin in heavy fermion compound, which makes electron mass even heavier. Okay, so everything all right? So that's straightforward. So, so let's just you know, ask this following question. So what is the uh, modification of the Fermi surface? due to electron phonon coupling. Of course, the electron band got modified, right? So 
there is a complicated, messy second term right here. And of course, it is really complicated to calculate this term, but we could analyze the slope of that band, which means that the band structure got corrected, and it will affect the curvature of your free electron band. So the new electron band is no longer a parabola, right? A quadratic band, but it will include a singular kind of a band structure. So let's just look at this second term, which is what we called this f function. So suppose we call this f function, which is the function of the free electron kinetic energy. So this complicated object is, is now called F capital F. So let's look at the slope or curvature of this new electron dispersion. And we could calculate this velocity of electron. Okay, so electron velocity is nothing but the slope or the derivative or the gradient in K space of the modified electron, right? So this is the, say, the free electron band. Suppose this is k squared. And the slope of this quadratic band is actually proportional to the velocity, right? So at the Fermi level, the slope refers to the Fermi velocity, which is the epsilon dk. Why is that? Because epsilon, remember, in the free electron band, is quadratically dependent on this momentum, right? Or this wave vector k. So you know this velocity in quantum mechanics is actually, or the momentum, h bar k, right? And the velocity is h bar k divided by n, right? Okay. And if you take the derivative of this epsilon respect to k, you get something proportional to k linear. Okay, of course, this quantity will be proportional to the velocity of electron. Of course, this, there is some prefactor which we could clean up later. Okay, so the gradient of this new electron band function, epsilon k prime, is actually given by h bar times the electron velocity. So it is the vector. Right? So, so let's just try to take the gradient of this epsilon prime. So of course, you get the first term gradient, which is the original Fermi velocity, which I call this h bar vk0. vk0 refers to electron velocity for a free electron. Okay, but there is additional contribution coming from the electron phonon coupling, which could be simplified further. So let's just look at this correction. So I could combine these two. Right? So I can simply just because the second term also is a function of epsilon k, and it's also a function of the gradient epsilon k. Right? As a result, I could simply just, by chain rule, combine these two contributions. Right? So there is a, the first term is 1, is nothing but this, this non-interacting from you know, this electron velocity. And the second term uh, is the derivative of this f function with respect to this free electron dispersion, epsilon k. So, so let's just try to evaluate this thing. 1 minus sum over k prime and square. So let's take a short break and erase the blackboard. And when we come back, we will finish this gradient of the modified electron band and then discuss you know, the change of the Fermi surface because of electron photon coupling. OK, so let's take a short break. Good, so let's just look at this velocity. Um, so let me just play some tricks, or not trick, but the approximation. We are taking the average value of this matrix element square and you know, uh, transform this summation over this momentum variable k prime to the energy integration by including the density of states. So this. I think by now you should be very familiar with such uh, change of variables in solid state. 
we do this all the time, always. When we have a momentum sum, we should transform this momentum sum to the energy integration and insert densive states. And uh, around zero temperature, this uh, densive states, of course, is a function of energy, but uh, for a fermionic electronic system, we take the approximation that densive states is fixed at the Fermi level. So this is just a constant, right? And then you deal with all the other messy stuff inside the submissions. Okay, so this is exactly what we do here. And then we take this energy derivative and the integral, and I shift this variables by some amount, which I call this eta. Let me just summarize this approximation. So we consider the average phonal frequency. We don't consider this Q dependence of frequency. Of course, this omega Q depends on Q, but you know, let's just forget about this Q dependence for now. And the density states at the Fermi level, we consider the average value of this matrix element. Of course, this approximation is you know, a bit crude, but we can still gain some insight, just ignore all this complicated you know, Q dependence and K and K prime dependence of this matrix element. And this eta is defined as epsilon K prime minus epsilon K. And this Fermi function here originally is a function of epsilon K prime, but now since I shift this, my variables by uh, epsilon k, and then I defined my new variables, which is eta plus epsilon k. So epsilon k prime is given by eta plus epsilon k, and, and then we could integrate over this uh, variable for eta. So you can very clearly see this integral become singular or divergent when eta is the same as h bar omega bar, right? So when the denominator vanishes, it gives you infinity, right? And this precisely the singularities that we will find in the electron band structure after including electron photon coupling, this will lead to some singular contributions to the electron velocity, right? So this integral, let me just right here, diverges when eta is actually h bar omega bar, or plus minus, because it's a square minus square, right? Okay. And let's just go back to the original variables, which means that you know, up to plus minus h bar omega bar, and if the electron energy differ from the Fermi energy by plus minus h bar omega bar, then you get a singularity. So then, we could take the derivative of the Fermi energy right here, respect to the energy, you know, electron energy epsilon k, because uh, this is the only contributions when we take the derivative. Right? So there's no, no other contributions uh, if we want to take the derivative of this integral. Okay? So, but we know that the Fermi function at zero temperature is a step function. So it is step-like function. But let's just use the variable that we just defined. When eta plus epsilon is the same as epsilon f or Fermi energy, and you got sharp jump, right? This is the step function. And this n or the Fermi function is a function of eta plus epsilon k. Remember, this is epsilon k prime originally. So, so now you want to you know, take a derivative of this Fermi function, and you will get a Dirac delta function. And right at this Fermi level, and you will get minus infinity. So because this is um, you know, a sharp, a sudden drop from 1 to 0 at 0 temperature of the Fermi function, therefore you take the derivative of this Fermi function respect to energy, you get the minus infinity, right? Not the plus infinity, because this function actually drops from 1 to 0. And as a result, you will see this minus infinity or minus Dirac delta function. 
eta plus epsilon k minus epsilon f. Good. And this Dirac delta function with minus sign uh, would appear uh, inside the integral over energy uh, d eta. And then we can easily integrate over that Dirac delta function. Remember, um, in your applied mass, so if you integrate over x and with such a function where this integral is a product of uh, some function f of x times the Dirac delta function, delta x minus a, and at the end of the integral, you get f as function of a. Because you only pick up the point where this delta function uh, becomes infinity or divergent, and delta function vanishes outside this range when x is not equal to a. So, so then you could easily integrate over this Dirac delta function. And let's just look at this final result. All right, so we, we got to clean up this, you know, corrections to the free electron, you know, Fermi velocity and the um, extra correction to the free electron velocity is given by this term. All right, so you can very easily see that when epsilon k minus epsilon kf is plus minus h bar omega bar, then you get uh, singular contributions to the electron velocity. And this is h bar vk0 times 1 plus. So, so if I made, I can simply just call this delta. And but this delta is actually negative. It is because when epsilon k is really close to the epsilon f, then this energy denominator is actually negative. Okay? And but then in the numerator, this all these quantities in the numerators are positive because h bar omega bar density of states and bar square are all positive values. And but the denominator can go negative because when epsilon k gets really close to epsilon f, and this difference you know, between these two electron energies is smaller than this average phonal energy. In that case, this you know, denominator becomes negative, and you get 1 minus something. Okay, So let me just minus this thing. So let's just use a standard definition called alpha, where alpha is this. And when I do this, this is approximation. So, so approximately, if this epsilon k is really at the Fermi level, and I can forget about this electron energy difference between epsilon k and epsilon f. Suppose this epsilon k is precisely or very close to epsilon f, then this term more or less vanishes. And then you end up with this minus h bar omega bar square. And this is precisely what happened in solid state materials, that you get mass enhancement. From the slope, you get electron mass. So let's look at the connection between the electron mass and the slope of this band structure. So this is the quadratic band that you know from the start. And suppose this is this marks this Fermi momentum, Kf. But then, as I mentioned, when this electron energy relative to the Fermi energy is within the plus minus h bar omega bar, then there's a divergence of the slope, right? Okay. Then you could very easily see this change of the slope is doing like this. So let me just mark this is h bar omega bar, and this is, again, h bar omega bar. So as you can see from here, let me use another color. So this is epsilon k, f, right, or the Fermi. So let me just use the energy, OK? Energy, this is epsilon f. OK, so when this epsilon is actually epsilon f, plus minus h bar omega bar, then you get a singularity, right? And this singularity is right here and right there. When the slope of your new dispersion becomes singular, and that's exactly when this denominator vanishes. But we are very 
And more interesting, this electron stays very close to the epsilon f. And for that electron state, almost exactly at Fermi level, and this is the slope change that the slope of the electron dispersion becomes smaller because there is a factor 1 minus alpha, and the alpha uh, is actually less than 1. Okay, so alpha is a positive value, less than 1. So you got some negative corrections to the free electron velocity. So the electron velocity becomes smaller, which means that the electron mass is enhanced. So let's just look at this mass enhancement. So the effective electron mass is actually inversely proportional to the curvature of your band, right? Because this, for free electron connecting energy, this is a quadratic form, right? This parabola in K, but then the electron mass is in a denominator. So if you would like to obtain the electron mass, what you do is that you take the second derivative of the electron energy for dispersion is back to K, and then take the inverse, right? Of course, there's a prefactor h bar square and factor of 2, which I don't care. So electron mass is actually proportional to inverse of the curvature, the second derivative of the electron band, right? That's from your elementary solid state one. So now the electron bands got modified to the new function, which shows such a strange curvature near this Fermi level. And so we could calculate this curvature of the new electron band and take the inverse of that curvature, we get the electron effective mass. Because by including the electron phonon coupling, this electron mass is no longer the free electron mass because it, as I mentioned, carry a, a center clause back, right? Okay, so let's just look at how heavy the center clause back. And this is proportional to, again, the slope of the velocity with the inverse. Because the slope is the first derivative of the, the band. And if you take the slope of the slope, you take the second derivative of the band, right? Okay? And this is proportional to what? 1 minus alpha in the denominator. 1 over 1 minus alpha. Of course, this is greater than 1 because alpha is somewhere between 0 and 1. Because you can very easily see that this electron phonon matrix element is actually very, very small. And the density stays that Fermi level is fixed, but h bar omega bar is large compared to the numerator. So everything combined with alpha is actually a positive value, but it's, it's uh, between 0 and 1. But you get uh, 1 over 1 minus alpha as the effective electron mass, and that is actually larger than 1. You take the ratio between this new effective electron mass to the you know, non-interacting electron mass, you get a factor which is greater than 1, which means that electron becomes heavier. Good. So this connects to your introductory uh, solid state 1, that you know, electron mass is enhanced due to electron phonon coupling. But uh, before you, know, you learn this second quantization formulation, um, you didn't know how to estimate the mass enhancement of electron. But now you know how to estimate this. Because this is nothing but the energy or band corrections from the electron phonon coupling to the electron band. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward calculation. So, and then this will give you a strong mass enhancement for electrons once electron phonon are coupled. And so let's finally let's look at the density of states. The density of states of electrons in a new band could be calculated from this new band structure of electrons. Because we know that the density of states of electron is actually the number of states per unit energy, right? Okay, which is the derivative of the total number of states respect to the energy, which means that how many states are available within the unit energy range. Okay? And of course this is given by again one minus alpha inverse, which is 
greater than 1, which means that, of course, you should divide this by the free electron density of states at the Fermi level. So you can very clearly see this enhanced density of states at the Fermi level uh, by looking at this new band structure. Because you know very well that over a tiny windows in energy, and there are many, many states. So let me just draw it here. So this looks like some kind of a flattened curve like this. And this is your quadratic band. And the new dispersion shows such a upturns and then turns into a flat curve and then goes up again. Okay, so there is a really flat region right here where, you know, over a really tiny range in energy which close to zero, if this curve is really flat, then over a really tiny window in energy, you get a whole spectrum of states. There are so many states around this flat region. Almost flat band, many states. So it has much more states uh, than this quadratic band give you at Fermi level. So when the band, you know, right at the Fermi level becomes flat, which means that the system accumulates many, many states um, over a tiny little bit energy window, okay, which means that there are many, many electron states available right at the Fermi level, and that enhanced density of states at the Fermi level uh, is completely due to electron phonon coupling. So this is a consequence of electron phonon coupling on the electron band. First, it's uh, you know, changed the curvature of the band structure near the Fermi level, and there are two singular points uh, you know, relative to the Fermi level by a plus minus h bar omega bar, and, and then it's enhanced the electron mass significantly, and then it reduces the electron velocity. Okay, so electron become heavier and slower moving uh, particles, and at the same time, there are many much more density of states accumulated at the Fermi level. Okay, and such phenomena has been observed in many, many solid state materials. Once you can actually measure this electron band structure, and you do see such a, you know, upturn and you know, uh, like a change curvature of electronic band, and then you do see more states available near the Fermi level, and you do see electron mass becomes <coughs> heavier. And these phenomena are real, and they could be understood in terms of electron phonon coupling alone. So I believe that this is um, complete and clear enough for all of you to understand the effect of electron phonon coupling, the electronic part. Okay, so this coupling coupled electron and phonons and lattice vibration and ions, so it affects everything, all the particles. Okay, and this phenomena has been known over 50 years, since 1960s. And then this phenomena can be understood by uh, simply just a, a second order and perturbation theory of the second quantized Hamiltonian, which includes electron phonon and electron phonon coupling. Okay, so let's take a 10 minutes break, and then we will finish this electron phonon chapter by arguing that this will lead to electron electron attraction. So let's continue. So the more interesting consequence of electron phonon coupling is the attraction between two electrons because of the electron phonon coupling. And this phenomena will lead to um, superconductivity in ordinary metals called the BCS theory, superconductivity. So we will introduce this phenomenology in the next lecture, or even later today. But let me just finish this electron phonon chapter by arguing and also deriving this attraction between two electrons. So you may feel very strange. It's really weird that two electrons attract to each other. How come? So I think from your kindergarten age, 
or elementary school age, you know that charged particles of the same sign only repel to each other, right? Like uh, two electrons must you know, go against with each other, so they don't like each other yeah, because they have the same charge. The coulomb force is actually proportional to the product of the two charged particles, Z1 and Z2, divided by this distance between these two, right? So that's from your EMM, right? Classical electrodynamics. You know very well that coulomb force gives you repulsive interactions between two charged particles of the same uh, sign, plus, plus, or minus, minus. How can two electrons like to stick together, right? And then this is the very uh, counterintuitive consequence of electron photon coupling that due to electron photon coupling, two electrons may overcome the Coulomb repulsion and they like to stick together with one another. Okay? So electron photon coupling overcome the repulsive Coulomb interaction between two electrons and make them attractive to each other. Okay, so this is a very important conclusion uh, that we will derive in just a moment. So how come? Let's look at this again, this electron photon energy, this epsilon 2, remember that. Epsilon 2 is this complicated sum. Let me just repeat this one more time. Okay, as I mentioned, there are two contributions. One term is proportional to the Bose factor NQ, phonon occupation, another is the electron occupation Fermi function, but um, everything should be multiplied by the Fermi functions outside of the bracket. Let's just analyze uh, one of the terms, which is proportional to the product of two Fermi functions. Let's look at this term, because la later you'll see that this term bear a striking similarity to the hartree fock energy that we discussed already. So one advantage that we discussed hartree fock is that we understand the Coulomb uh, interactions between electrons in the simplest uh, way. Okay? And then we could actually um, make an analogy between this electron-electron interaction by electron phonon to the hartree fock energy. Okay, so let's just look at this term which we call this epsilon c. So roughly speaking, we could you know, make it just the average of this product to occupation of electrons nk, nk prime. You know, at low temperatures, these two uh, you know, product and this, the product inside the bracket, expansion value, give you uh, roughly the same value. So let's just look at this form. And you could you know, make uh, this term very much similar to the hartree fock energy. Okay? So let's just transform this term. Let's make the square in the denominator, and, and I insert this minus sign inside this part of the two Fermi functions. Okay. And then we could make further approximations. We know that in the, not approximation, but the, uh, from the symmetry considerations, this term that I circled here is actually anti-symmetric when we sum over both k and k prime. So let me just, because uh, we need to sum over both k and k prime, when we sum over this term, I could exchange this k and k prime as I like. But when I exchange this term in the denominator, you don't change anything because this is the square of this epsilon k minus epsilon k prime, but in the numerator, you change the sign. But when you sum over both k and k prime, you got minus of this. It's actually minus. So if I interchange you know, definition of k and k prime, I got a minus sign, right? And therefore, this vanishes simply by the symmetry considerations. OK, so I can forget about this first term because the first term, when I sum over k and k prime, give us the anti-symmetric properties, so then it vanishes. And so the resulting term is just the second term, where you have uh, photon energy in the numerator. So 
let's look at this. N times this minus Nk, Nk prime average. So let's look at this Hartree-Fock energy. Of course, we know that Hartree-Fock energy is not accurate, even wrong, but the mathematical structures of the Hartree-Fock energy uh, describes the electron coulomb interactions, okay, which is repulsive. By comparing the mathematical structures of the Hartree-Fock energy and the energy of electrons due to electron phonon coupling, and you could very clearly see the correspondence between these two. So let's just review this Hartree-Fock energy. It's again the summation over K and K prime, but inside the summation you have a repulsive Coulomb interactions, right? Multiplied by the second order minus sign of this NK NK broad average. Okay, so this is called exchange energy. This is called exchange energy. Remember that. And this minus sign is very really important because this tells you this, you know, this uh, sign is uh, correct because this comes from the second order perturbation. And um, this Hartree Fock energy tells you the energy that comes from the electron electron interactions to the electron energy acquires such a correction, exchange energy. So, this exchange energy, remember, uh, tells you the energy of uh, electron electron interactions within the Hartree Fock. Remember, this is the energy of such uh, processes K prime and K and K and K prime, and this is photon, right? And we don't care about the Hartree energy. This is the energy due to Mr. Fogg, so we call it the Fogg energy, exchange energy. And if you look at this mathematical structure of the Fogg energy, and this electron phonon generated correction to electron energy, and they bear striking similarities, okay? Why? Because if you compare this term and that term, it differs only by the strength of the interaction. Okay? So in the Hartree Fogg term, you get this Coulomb energy. That is precisely the repulsive interaction between two electrons. But here, electron photon generated correction to electron energy has this different form of this h bar omega q divided by this square minus that square. Okay? But other than that, they are identical. Of course, there is an a electron phonon matrix element square, but I can just combine these two. So these two factors, when we combine together, plays the same role as the Coulomb interaction, right? Okay? So both terms uh, include the summation over K and K prime and some interactions, okay? And times this average of the minus NK and K prime, so this term is precisely that term. Okay, so the only difference is the interaction inside this yellow box or the red box. And we could very clearly identify it that, you know, the red box here plays the same role as the effective electron-electron interaction. Okay? So, which means that the red box square times is actually equivalent to something like electron-electron Coulomb interaction. But not the same. Of course, they are not the same. But it tells us that electron phonon coupling after second order in perturbation theory could actually lead to some effective electron electron interactions. Just like the electron electron cool interactions that we studied within the Hartree Fock theory. Understand? This is the one to one correspondence between effective electron electron interactions in the electron phonon system and the Hartree Fock energy from electron electron cool interactions. So, we make an analogy between these two kinds of interactions between two electrons. And as a result, you could use the cartoon picture, such as you know, this kind of electron-electron Coulomb scattering diagram, but then due to electron phonon coupling. So 
we know that this energy correction that we calculated is from the second order perturbation, and this is precisely the diagram corresponding to the second order in perturbation theory, where we actually copy electron phonon coupling vertex twice, right? So this is this is a copy of the same electron phonon coupling in the second order perturbation theory uh, twice, and then you connect this phonon, so-called propagator, and therefore you have such a diagram. And this diagram exactly gives you this kind of energy corrections. But the interpretation of such a diagram is the electron-electron interaction from electron phonon coupling. So we should correctly interpret this diagram as electron-electron effective interaction via electron phonon coupling, which is exactly the same interpretation that we did in the Hachi Falk chapter, right? Where this energy of the exchange term of Mr. Falk term comes from electron electron Coulomb interactions. And this is the diagram which leads to such a electron electron Coulomb repulsive energy, which we call this exchange energy. So the mathematical form between these two are exactly the same. And therefore we could find a correctly a correct way to interpret the uh, effect of electron-electron interactions by mediate by electron phonon, and and you could identify that the something inside the red box should be the effect of electron-electron interaction due to electron phonon. Okay, so and let's look at whether this effect of electron-electron interaction is repulsive or attractive. So let's look at the sign whether this is a plus sign or minus sign, because remember, we need to absorb this minus sign inside this Fermi product here, and this Coulomb interaction is positive for sure, because this is uh, the repulsive interaction between two electrons by Coulomb, right? So the sign of this term tells you that this is repulsive. As a result, um, because we have such an uh, identification between these two source of the um, electron-electron interactions, and therefore the sign, the positive you know, negative sign of this term determines whether this is repulsive or attractive. Agree? Because this positive sign here tells you this is the repulsive electron-electron Coulomb repulsion, and by the same way, whether this term is positive or negative will determine whether this is repulsive or attractive. So if this term is positive, then of course this is repulsive. If this term can be negative, of course this is attractive. All right? Okay, so this is a very important argument here. And so we will argue and derive that indeed when two electrons are very close to the Fermi surface, then you know the sign of this term inside the red box is minus. Why? In the same reason that I told you that when these two electrons are very close to Fermi surface and close to zero temperature, and the difference between these two energies is really tiny compared to this phonon energy. And therefore, we can forget about this term right here. And now you see there's a minus sign here. Right? And this clearly tells you that this term gives you a negative sign, which means that the two electrons are really attractive to each other. So this is the mathematical reasoning and the very rigorous reasoning from the mathematical structure of the uh, second order uh, energies due to electron-electron and also electron phonon. But comparing this form, you argue and derive that this must be attraction. But how attractive it is, and you will see very clearly that this is even more negative and more attractive than the Coulomb repulsive. So we don't have time to, to calculate this and check this, but we know very well that these two potentials, electron-electron interaction by electron phonon, is really negative. But it's more negative than this repulsive electron-electron interaction by Coulomb. And when we sum over this two, this is still negative. 
this is the key point of a, a BCS theory of superconductivity that attraction between two electrons by electron phonome overcomes the repulsive cooling interaction between two electrons. So the overall the net you know, interactions between two electrons is still attractive. Which means that at very low temperatures, because of electron phonon coupling, this will induce the effective attraction between two electrons, which overcomes the repulsive cooling interactions. So this is really counterintuitive, but this is really what happens in solid states, which you know, defied all your understanding of charge particle interactions. So let me just use a very uh, simple cartoon picture to illustrate how you could understand this in a very intuitive way so that you don't forget. The control picture is this. So uh, you won't find this cartoon picture in any textbooks. This is my unique recipe <laughs> that helps you to understand this physics. And I'm, I'm proud that this, phys you know, this picture is really efficient. And when I draw this picture, you immediately understand what happens. OK, so this is the electron, say, moving along this direction right here. But of course, you know that this electron coupled to phonon, right? OK, so there are some positive ions right here and right there. And uh, you know, as a whole, that we could consider this as a, as a polaron. Remember that. So this is a polaron. So tell me, what is the sign of this polaron charge, positive or negative? Yes, positive. I use a blue cross to represent such a net charge within the polaron. All right? And if there is another electron com coming by, where does it go? It sees the negative charge electron, or it sees the positive charge polaron. Which one? Of course, it sees the polaron carry positive charge. And for the negative charge electron, what does it you know, want to go? Of course, it wants to get attracted to that positive charge polaron. But if you forget about the ions, just look at these two electrons. If you just look at these two electrons, what do you see? Well, you see the attraction right, between two electrons. You don't just, just forget about, ignore this background environment. Just look at these two electrons. You know, when, when they interact, what do they see? Well, they, they see attraction between each other because of this polaron physics. And that is precisely the physics here that the polaron physics make this net charge inside the polaron positive and which attract another negative charge electron. Of course, you say that this electron is also a polaron. But well, but of course, some electrons must, I should say, see this attraction. right? And another more classical cartoon picture that uh, helps you to understand this physics, physics is this trampoline physics. If you have a, a bat which is really flexible, called trampoline, right? Okay, so people can jump up and down on the trampoline, uh, and then they, they could actually turn over. And suppose there is a heavy ball uh, dropped in the middle of the trampoline, the bed. It's, you know, it's really flexible bed. And so it makes a kind of a curve, right? A downward curve in the middle of the bed, OK? And suppose there is another little ball right here, and he feel this potential. Of course, it will slide down and want to you know, be in the same place as this, you know, this middle ball here, because it feels this negative potential, or, or this parabola that, created, that is created by this uh, initial big ball here. And of course, there's no quantum mechanics here. It's just a classical analogy. So, and this kind of a, a 
attractive potential that is created by this big ball is precisely this polaron physics right here. Because of the polaron physics, it creates such a kind of a background charge which is positive. Of course, it will attract another electron because of this, report, you know, this kind of a positive charge polaron. So the polaron can actually attract another uh, more free electrons. So um, this actually cartoon pictures help you to really understand this rigorously mathematical statement that we just derived that two electrons can feel attraction because of this electron phonon coupling, which defies the overcome this Coulomb repulsive interaction between two electrons. So of course we don't have time to estimate how can this net potential can still be attractive, um, then you need to sum over all this matrix element square and this numerator denominator and so on and so forth. And by the end of the day, so uh, some physicists already calculated already for us that this attraction compensates the repulsion by Coulomb. Okay, so and therefore this attraction um, will have a huge consequence to the low temperature property, especially the transport and magnetic properties of metals, and in particular it will lead to the superconducting state that you know two electrons can actually form a Cooper pair, and and when they form a Cooper pair, this Cooper pair is a boson because two electrons with opposite spins they may pair up because they feel this attraction and then they get both condensed at zero temperature limit, and then this condensate bosons are superconducting particles, okay, which makes this resistivity drop to zero for temperature below transition temperature for ordinary metal. And this phenomena, uh, which we call the superconductivity, was actually discovered experimentally almost more than 100 years ago, 19 11, okay, just one year before the ROC was established. So then this is the end of the electron phonon chapter, and please read the corresponding chapters in our references, and we will continue next Monday talking about this phenomenology of our superconductors in ordinary metals, and then when we finish this BCS theory, we'll come back to this magnetic and magnon and spin wave analysis of magnetic materials. And then we end the, our semester's course. I hope you enjoy this course and study hard and you'll learn a great deal of physics. Okay, I'll see you on next Monday.